Welcome to the God's Word Bible study, and we will start with a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, we thank you, Lord, for all that you have done for us. And as we open your book, Lord, we ask that you will teach us, that you will give us the courage and the strength, Lord, to do what you say. In the holy name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior, we pray. Amen. Okay, so the last time we were here, we discussed very briefly the Lord's Prayer. And we parted company by just mentioning forgiveness and its importance. So we'd like to start there today, right where we left off, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 14. Matthew chapter 6, verse 14. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you. Now, Jesus I just finished giving what we know today as the Lord's Prayer. And immediately after the Amen, he goes back to something that he had mentioned in the prayer, where he said, Forgive us this day. Forgive us this day our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now, the reason why Christ goes back to this is because forgiveness is so important. Our willingness to forgive is the first real sign that we have been born again. It is the first trait of our Father that we adopt. So what Christ was saying is that in his prayer, he puts a condition on God's ability to forgive us. And this is why I say people should be very careful not to just say these prayers in the Bible as mantras, because you're saying things that you are obligating yourself to. And so in the Lord's Prayer, it says... Only forgive us, Lord, as we forgive others. So in the same way that we forgive, that's the way we want you to forgive us. Now, folks, that's not a pretty picture, is it? Because even those of us who do forgive, and from my experience, that is not the entire body of Christ, because a lot of us still haven't learned to forgive. But even those of us who have learned to forgive, we forgive in a very harsh way, don't we? Because when we forgive, we normally cut the person off. So we say that we forgive them, but we will have nothing to do with with them in the future. We will never give them another chance. We will never open the door of opportunity. We will never welcome them back into our homes. This is not how we want God to forgive us. And thank God that this is not the way he forgives. When you forgive, you forgive unconditionally. So this is how I normally explain forgiveness. Forgiveness is someone stabbing you in the back, you taking out the knife, forgiving them, giving them back the knife, and turning your back again. Okay? That's forgiveness. You put the person in the same position that they were before they offended you. But he goes on and he says, If you forgive men their trespasses, your father will also forgive you. You're not kinder than God. So if you're doing it, God is doing it. Okay? There's a verse in the Bible that says, Whosoever sin you retain, it is retained in heaven. Whosoever sin you release, it is released in heaven. Folks, Whosoever you bind on earth. Right. Folks, you can't be more generous than God. So what all that verse is saying is that, listen, whenever you forgive, God forgives right along with you. And whenever you retain it, God retains it. Let me explain this. There's two applications for this. One, if I refuse to forgive, that unforgiveness becomes a block in my own spiritual war. It's actually a mark against me in the sight of God. Okay, that's the first thing. The second thing is that there are instances where we will not forgive someone and it will be up to God to forgive them. And if they have been warned and we go through the right processes, then that sin against that person, that sin that that person has forgiven, will be retained by God and then they'll have to deal with him. But we have to go through all the processes that we are taught to go through. So if the brother sin against us, we're supposed to go to him privately. Then if he doesn't listen, then we take one other person and we talk to him again. Then if he doesn't, then we do what? Then we take him before the church. So it's a three-step process. We can't decide that he's not going to listen to us or anybody, so we just take him directly to the church. It doesn't work that way. Okay, we have to follow the processes. And if we follow the processes, it's three strikes and you're out. It's first alone, then with a brother, then with the church. 
And if he doesn't listen to any of those pleas for reconciliation, then we place him in the hand of God where he belongs. All right? Verse 15, Matthew chapter 6, verse 15 says, But if ye forgive men not their trespasses, neither will God forgive your trespasses. So, if you remember, God says that I hate divorce, right? He said, I hate divorce. I hate this thing, man. But in the Torah, he gave us a writing of divorcement. So even though God hates it, God allows it. And Jesus explains this and he says that the only reason why God gave it was because of the hardness of our hearts. So even when there, even when, um, there is infidelity within marriage, God's solution is never divorce. Never, ever, ever. But he says that because we are so unwilling to forgive and God knows that we will carry this grudge against our spouse to the grave, he says, okay, fine. I will allow you to divorce them so that both of you don't end up in hell. But ideally, God's method and God's way is for us to forgive each other because just as our spouse cheated, so do we cheat on our husband, God the Father, don't we? We do it day after day and we come back with the sheepish look on our face and we say, Father, forgive us and he does what he forgives us. But it was spiritual adultery, wasn't it? All right, so this thing about forgiveness, and I'm, I'm really stressing this right now because, as I mentioned last time, someone can offend you, okay? And that person offend you and is off on his merry way, probably not, not even realizing that he did offend you. Get right with God, dies and go to heaven. You're here and you're hating that person's gut because he offended you and hurt you so bad. And later on, you die and you go to hell. And when you are brought before the judgment seat of God, you realize that the only reason why you went to hell was because that brother offended you. Now, look at that. He offended you, but you went to hell for it. That's unforgiveness. The second thing about unforgiveness is unforgiveness allows one act of cruelty to repeat itself over and over and over in your life. So you go through the same pain, not once, but multiple times. Every time you hear this person's name or every time a certain music play or you smell a certain scent, you remember this and it's fresh as the days happen. You are hurting. Now, we're supposed to be at least sensible enough to know that we don't put ourselves through the same misery over and over and over. And the only antidote for this is forgiveness. I remember that I once carried something against someone and every time the person's name, the person's name was Bill, William, you know, Sean and Bill. And every time Bill's name was mentioned, there would be a white hot poker like a ball of fire just rising up in my from my stomach upward and this was so weird because bill is a pretty popular word you know because for example my brother-in-law's name was bill and so every time somebody said hey bill um i'm true back into this thing or my wife i'll be home watching tv and my wife will say hey maurice did you pay the bill and there i go again so Unforgiveness will do this, but once you forgive and you learn to pray for the person, not that God will give him what he deserves, but that God will have mercy upon his soul and save him to his, to his kingdom, then you will find that this unforgiveness becomes, becomes generosity in you. And now you are able to treat that person as God would want you to treat him. Jesus told a story in Matthew chapter 18, verse 29. Matthew chapter 18 and verse 29. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me. Well, actually, to understand this, we're going to have to go back to where the story started. There was this fellow who owed his master a whole lot of money, and various pastors have tried to figure out exactly how much money that was in today's dollars, and some of them come up with some outrageous amounts, you know, $3 billion, $10 billion, whatever it is. That is not the point. The point is that he owed more than he could ever pay. Okay, so that's the point. He owed his master more than he could ever pay. And could you start reading that at verse 23? Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, 
which would take account of his servant. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him ten thousand talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and his children, and all that he had in payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of the servant was moved with compassion, and loosed him, and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him an hundred pence, and he laid hands on him, and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that you owest me. And his servant fell down at his feet, and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison, till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry, and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called them, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And the Lord was wroth, and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your heart forgive not every one his brother their trespass. Okay, so this servant owed his master more than he could ever hope to pay. He, he just couldn't pay. It. Not if he worked every day for the rest of his life. But he asked his master and his master forgave him. He goes out and he finds someone who owed him a dollar. And he refused to forgive him. And he beat the guy up because the guy couldn't pay him the dollar. Here's what this story is saying. And this story is true of every single human being that has ever lived. Each of us owes God more than we could ever hope to pay. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We can fix this. But God comes along and he says, listen... I am going to cancel your debt. But unlike this king that Jesus is talking about, who just forgave the debt, God can't just forgive our debt. He has to actually pay the debt. And so what he does is that he goes and he sacrifices his only begotten son to cover our debt so that we may be free. But then we turn around and someone offends us by not saying good morning and we carry that garage with us for months and God is looking at this and he's saying if you understood what happened when I forgave your sin you wouldn't be like this but some of us will say no 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 we understand what God did for us now I'm gonna tell you that if you can say that you understand what God did for you and you still are carrying around grudges and are still not forgiving people, then you're even worse than the people who don't know what God did for them, who are really ignorant of the enormity of the gift of salvation and what it cost God. Because if I understood what Jesus had to suffer for my sake in order for me to be forgiven, and I turn around and because of my pride, and my feelings I refuse to forgive as he has taught me to forgive, then I'm worse than an infidel, and whatever is coming my way, I deserve more than anything. The cost of forgiveness. So when we look at it, Jesus told us this prayer, the Lord's Prayer, and the only thing in the entire prayer that he reiterates is forgiveness. Because forgiveness is the most important principle of the kingdom of God as far as we human beings are concerned. Forgiveness will stop us from going into heaven. It will stop us from realizing all the gifts that God has for us. It will stop us from living the life that we are called to live. And ultimately, it will stop us from receiving the very thing that God has offered to us, which is forgiveness. You want to add anything there? Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we are at Matthew chapter 6. We're back at Matthew chapter 6, verse 16. And it says, 
Moreover, when ye fast, be ye not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head, and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Okay, so we're right back with fasting where we were with um, prayer in the marketplace and all that, where we went over the fact that we only get one reward. If we're praying or we're doing whatever we're doing to be seen of men and for men to admire us, then God doesn't take note of that. God doesn't give us anything for that. We got what we worked for, which was the admiration of people. He's saying that when it comes to fasting, it's the same principle. If we're going to make everybody know that I'm fasting by going around with a sad countenance and looking gaunt and drawn and sad so that everybody will ask us, what's the matter? And then we can say piously, oh, I'm fasting. <laughs> then that's the only reward you're going to get. Which is kind of sad because what are the reasons for fasting, biblically speaking? What are the reasons for fasting? It is you entreating God for something, whether it be a physical thing or something that you need to realize or uncover. Okay. All right, so we fast when we're in trouble, when we're entreating God for something. So, for example, whenever Israel realized that they were in sin, they would do what? They would fast. Remember Jonah going to Nineveh, and after he had preached throughout the street that destruction was coming, the king heard, he believed, and he commanded all his people to do what? To fast and to pray. So they're in trouble, so they're fasting. That's one reason for fasting. Another reason for fasting is to get closer to God. So we might be in a situation where we are just, just needing to have a closer walk with God. And so at that point, we might decide that we are going to fast so that we can seek his face. When we do this, what we're doing is that we're putting away everything that detracts from God. So fasting, in a nutshell, is not just not eating. It is putting away good things, abstaining from good things so that we can concentrate on God. So we might... In our fasting time, if we're really serious, we might abstain from eating. So once we decide that we're not going to eat, our mind isn't fasting on, okay, what's for lunch, and planning that type of thing. But we might also say we're going to not have sex. Paul mentioned it, and he says that if you're going to fast, you must first agree with each other. Because if you go ahead and you just decide that you're going to go on a fast, you're not going to have sex for a couple of days, then you're robbing your spouse of what is rightfully theirs. So you can fast from, from sex, you can fast from pleasures, television, so sports, whatever. Whatever um, distracts you from God. Basically anything that, that would normally bring you pleasure, you're denying yourself that you're, pleasure because you are entreating God for whatever it is. Right. You can also show God your seriousness for your upcoming petition. Exactly, right. So let's get this in a little perspective because I was once in a church once and they were having a, a fast coming up that they were gonna fast, I think for like a day or something. And the elder that was in charge says that, you know, you can fast from any of these things and you know, one of the things you can fast from is sin. And I almost fell out of my chair because you do not fast <laughs> from sin. Because the things that you're fasting from, the reason why the reason, objects of your fast are things that you're going to return to. Mm. So you can only fast from good things, okay? So you can only fast from good things. From bad things, you don't fast. You abstain, right. complete abstinence, mm. okay? <laughs> so let's get that straight. When it comes to fasting, it's, it's putting away good things. Not putting away bad things that we weren't supposed to be doing in the first place. Alright? So that's fasting. Remember Jesus went upon the Mount of Transfiguration. And when he went upon the Mount of Transfiguration and he came down, this gentleman came running to him 
and saying, help me, Lord. I came to your disciples and they weren't able to, to do anything. Okay. After Jesus went ahead and he cast out, I think that is Matthew chapter 17, verse 14. And we'll read it in a minute, but I'll just tell you how it went. After Jesus cast out the, the demon out of that young man, the disciples came to him and they asked him a very important question. They say, how is it that we were not able to do this? Now, just to put this into context, they had just come, returned from one of their missionary trips. Mm -hmm. And when they came back and they had given Jesus a report, one of the things that they said was that even the demons are subject to us. So right after they came back having victory over these demons, they met this young man who had a demon and they couldn't get rid of it. So Matthew chapter 17, verse 14. And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and sore vexed. For oft times he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Okay. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart, and said, Why could we not cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit, this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. Okay, so in a nutshell, what Jesus was saying here is that, you know, they say more prayer, more power. And the highest form of prayer is when you're fasting, because that is uninterrupted, intense petition to God. And Jesus is saying, if you want the power, you got to fast, you got to pray. Hold on. Let's get this into perspective again because sometimes we hear get the power and that's all we hear. We hear get the power. So now we're going to go fast. Power with God is a strange animal because the power that I get from God is not to do my will. It is to do his will. Okay. So for example, Jesus says, one of my favorite texts, he says that what? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Many times I sit and I listen to a sermon and at the end of the sermon the appeal that they give is who wants the kingdom of God? The devil is the first one who jumps out of his seat and says me, 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 me. <laughs> okay, everybody wants the kingdom of God. But God says seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Mm -hmm. Now here's the thing about it is that we might want the kingdom of God, but we don't want his righteousness. Okay, we see this in the book of Esther. If you remember with, um, what was his name? Esther's husband. King? Yeah. Not, not Esther, not Esther. <laughs> Ruth. Ruth. Boaz. Boaz. Boaz was the second in line in the Redeemer procession. Okay, mm -hmm. he, he couldn't act unless the guy who is first mm -hmm. gives up his right. So he stops him in, in the gates and he says to him, Hey, Ruth has this field and you are the first in line for the redemption. So if you want to redeem it, redeem it. If not, I'll redeem it. The guy says, Of course I want that field. Then Boaz says, Yeah, but remember, if you take the field, you have to also take Ruth, the Moabitess, so that you can raise up kids for Chilean, our husband, the dead. Because what God did is that he didn't want our names to be forgotten in Israel. So if you died without having children and you have a wife, then your brother or the next near kinsman would have a child by her and the child would be your child. And so your name would continue in Israel. When he heard this, the guy said, no, 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 no. I don't want that because that's going to mar my inheritance. So he wants the kingdom, but he doesn't want the responsibility. He wants the field, but not the Okay? And it's the same thing with us. We want the kingdom of God, but we don't want his righteousness because his righteousness will stop us from doing what we want to do with the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Because all we want to do with God's kingdom is to maximize our pleasure. 
One aspect of fasting, which is to seek power, is coming to God saying, God, I have been living as best as I can to please you, but I am dissatisfied with what I'm doing for you. So give me more power so that I can do more for you so that you will be more pleased. Okay, now get this. You're not asking God to be more pleased with you because you're doing more. Because God is already pleased with you because you're his child. Okay? But you want him to be, it's like a kid, you know, I know that daddy loves me. But when I do something that particularly tickle daddy and I can see that, that twinkle in his eye, that's what gives me maximum power. So God, I want maximum pleasure. So give me some more, more power so that I can do some more for you so that I can see that twinkle more often. And so that is one aspect of it. So that, that's when you're seeking for power, you're seeking for knowledge. These things, because knowledge is power. So these things when you're seeking, it is so that you can do more for God that he has already told you he wants you to do. Uh, the second part of fasting, which is more um, illustrated in the Bible, is when I realize that I've sinned and I'm in deep trouble. And so now, as a part of how I feel, I stop eating, I stop spending time in front of the mirror, I put those things aside because I'm seeking God and I want him to know just how badly I feel about my behavior. Let's look at it. A lot of times in the Bible when God told his people to take their jewelry off, it was as a sign of their contrite. contriteness. Okay? So for example, when Jacob was returning from Laban, God told him, go up to Bethel. But before he went up to Bethel to be with God, to worship God, he told his family, take off your jewelry and remove your false god from you. And he took them and he buried them under a tree. Then they went up. Because here's what happened. If I am really, really sorry, and I know that what I have done has angered my God so much, and I go to my God on bended knees, repenting and asking him for forgiveness, and he takes a look at me and he realized that I just spent 15 minutes putting on my makeup and making sure my jewelry and my clothes was right. Mm -hmm. God is going to ask, exactly how sorry were you? Mm -hmm. Because if you were really sorry, you wouldn't be so concerned with how you look. You will be concerned about how you look in my eyes, not in the eyes of your neighbors. And so when God told them to put on sackcloth and ashes, that's just another way of saying, listen, put away this concern for how you look in other people's eyes for one minute because you need to get right in my eyes. Now, once you're right in my eyes, you can go back and put on your fineries. But for now, if you're worried about your fineries, then you're not that concerned about me. And what you're doing is just an act of hypocrisy. Yeah, you, you see, if, um, for example, a parent hears that their child is in danger or, or got hurt or something, they're just going to grab their, their car key or whatever to get to that child. They're, they're not concerned about what they're wearing or how even how they look. Their concern is only to get to the child. And, and, and similarly, when you have a heart of Christ, you're not concerned with what other people are thinking about you. All your aim is, is to do what the Lord wants you to do, to get it done, to go where he needs you to be at that moment, to do what he needs you to do. Okay. Now, if you're a Christian and you want to grow, you should set aside time to fast. This time of fasting is it's private. It's, it's nobody's business what you're doing. Some of the times when I fast, for example, my wife doesn't know that I'm fasting because I don't tell her. I just don't eat and I seek God. Years ago, when I told people, when I just started fasting myself, and I, I don't go on long fast, fast um, it's usually just for like a day, but that's me. If you want to do a week or a month or whatever, that's on you. Let me know and I, I'll pray with you. <laughs> but what I used to do is I would just go and just fast. And what would happen is that I keep the Sabbath holy, which is Friday night to Saturday night. And so what I would do is on Saturdays, I would fast. That's the day I would fast. And in church, every time the issue of fasting comes up, people would always say, you can fast on the Sabbath because that's when you're supposed to be joyful before God. 
Well, I didn't find that when I wasn't eating, I was less joyful before God. But this is why I personally fast on Sabbath. During the week, I'm an accountant. So during the busy season, I used to work from Sunday to Friday. And the only day I really had off was Saturday. I find that fasting from Sunday to Friday didn't work for me because even if I wasn't eating, I wasn't paying God any attention anyway because I was busy working. So the only day that I wasn't working was Saturday when I was in church. And that's the day I'm paying God all my attention anyway. So putting aside food so I can pay attention more closely to him worked for me. For most people, it didn't work because they thought that there was something wrong with fasting on Sabbath because some of they pictured fasting as being sad. That is not what fasting is. It doesn't have to be sad. It just has to be concentrated and focused on your God. Now, let me tell you something. Unless you're in trouble, which is the second aspect of fasting, you shouldn't be sad. If you're seeking him for more knowledge, more power, a closer walk, then you should be happy in his presence. And that is also fasting. Okay, and on that note, let's say a word of prayer and we'll meet up next time. May God bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. So until we meet the next time, may God bless you. Amen.